We're not going to use our time this afternoon to try to, to prove to you from history that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, we can see from this chapter we've just read that in the first century there were those who were already, uh, presumably within, therefore within 30 years of Jesus being raised from the dead, who were already doubting it and saying it hadn't happened. Um, the authority on this subject is God. And that's where, we be, that's where we're, we're taking our thoughts from. God has revealed in his word, the Bible, a great purpose with the, the people of his creation. He created all things. He is God. He's the only uncreated. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created because he had a purpose. We can read of that purpose throughout the, throughout the Bible. Um, <clears throat> perhaps a good place to, to look at, to, to, uh, to begin. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians, but perhaps a good place to begin is Isaiah 45. Um, because here we have the Bible's position on God's greatness, as it were, and his reason for creating. <clears throat> So Isaiah chapter 45, and, and perhaps start there at verse 5, where we told, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. God, his position is, he is God. He's, he's created all things. There's no other God. And there's no other source of help for us. And all things are in God's control. He has a purpose with the earth. And um, that purpose is perhaps, um, we'll see that in... Uh, in chapter, no, in verse 12 of this chapter, I have made the earth and created man upon it. Even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Right? And then look at verse 18. Thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he formed, he hath made it to be in, he established it Sorry, he hath, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there's no else. We're, we're left in no doubt, are we? This is God's word. And he's revealed in his word his person and his purpose. He's created all things. And all people on the earth are subject to him. We may deny him, as many people do. But it doesn't change the, the position that God, there is one, there is a God. And he is in complete control in creation. And all people in creation are subject to him. And they will all come under his judgment, as it were, at the end of uh, things. Come over with me now to, uh, to the New Testament then. A similar thing, uh, we're going to Acts chapter 17. Now here's Paul preaching about this great God. He's preaching to the Athenians um, on one of his journeys. He's come to Athens, and he's found Athens is, is a place where all manner of gods are worshipped. Everything that you could think of was a god. You know, there was a god to it. Just, and just in case, it, it appears, just in case they'd missed a god, they had one to an unknown god. So they tried to cover all, all the gods. Um, and Paul goes there, and he's, his, his message is, there is a God, he has a purpose, and it involves raising people from the dead. Now, you know, you see the reception he gets. It starts in verse, uh, verse 16 of this chapter. It says, 
While Paul waited for his companions, uh, Silas and Timothy at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout people and in the markets daily with them that met with him. Certain philosophers of the Epicureans and Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seems to be a set of forth of strange gods. So, so we're obviously talking about one of the gods they hadn't covered. You know, they'd not got covered. Um, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. They'd never heard this one before. But this, there is some ones, there is a God who is going to raise the dead, who has raised the dead in the person of Jesus and who is going to raise the dead. And we can see their consternation. They just they wanted to know about what this was all about. And it says, verse 21, it's their position. All the Athenians and strangers which spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to know some new thing. It was, it was knowledge that was, was which God really, um, not uh, someone that was... Uh, they were subject to. Paul stood in the midst of Martyr and said, I, you men of Athens, I perceive you in all things, you're too superstitious. Uh, I, as I passed by, I beheld your devotions and I, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now here it is. Now this is, this is God through, through Paul stating the position that we're all in. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Consistent, isn't it? From the, from the beginning to the end of the Bible, that's the consistent message. We're all subject to God. He's made all things. He's made, of, he's made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the, of, the, uh, of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. God's in complete control of the nations. We all come from one blood. We know that from DNA. We have one ancestor. Adam. Um, and... The nations, as they've been formed, they grow and they, de and they decrease, and that's all under the control of this great God who's, who's, um, earth, who's created the earth. Right, now, so, verse 27 is what life is for. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. So the purpose of life that's been given to, to everyone by God is that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. And God's given evidence of his existence, of his being. And he's saying to, to, to us, look at the evidence. He's not asking us to have a blind belief in something that's impossible. He's saying, look at the evidence. Look at my word and... Um, feel after me and find me um, that they may feel after and find him though he be not far from every one of us um, he's on hand he, he wants to be found for in him we live and move and have our, our being we only exist because God exists um, and only have being because of him as certain also of your own poets have said we are also his offspring uh, for as much then as we are the offspring of God we ought not to think that the Godhead is like to some to unto silver or gold or stone craven by, by, or man's device God, 
God can't be made. An image can't be made of God. In fact, he forbade, he forbids it. Uh, to his people Israel in the Old Testament it was the first commandment thou shalt have no other gods beside me thou shalt not make an idol unto thee of any form to represent me and the times of ignorance God winked at but now commands all men everywhere to repent but God's saying you have the evidence of my existence of my being it's in creation it's in my word seek after me and find me and when you do that you'll realise you need to repent that's a word we don't hear much of it means uh, literally you have to turn around you've got to turn your life around you've got to change direction you've got to I'll not acknowledge me and understand that we don't live to, the, to God's requirements. He's given us life and we fail in that life to, to do his will. But he's provided a way that we can repent of that. And that way is through Jesus, his son, in which he goes on to say in this next verse. He's appointed a a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he's given assurance unto all men in that he's raised him from the dead. So he's identifying Jesus, the one that they knew he was talking about. It said so earlier, didn't it? He talked to them about Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. So Jesus is the, the way that God has given for men and women to come to him. In a, in a sense to feel after him and to find him Jesus is the way we know the, the, the most famous verse in the Bible we're told is John 3 verse 16 God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoso believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so it's God's will that we have everlasting life he wants us to find this way and the way is in his son Jesus and we have to come to Jesus and to acknowledge that he is the way he, and what did it say at the beginning of that chapter 15 that we, we read um, about the purpose then of Jesus being introduced into the world he's God's son brought into the world but brought into the world of a human mother Mary and therefore having our nature and here he is um, <clears throat> described in uh, I suppose in, in outline verse 3 of, of 1 Corinthians 15 I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture so the death of Jesus was the means whereby God would br bring forgiveness of sins and the proof of that is that Jesus rose again on the third day. So God has provided a way. He's, he said, he, he's, he's introduced his son and amazingly, Jesus lived for three, 33 years on the earth where the scripture record tells us, the, the gospels tell us. And for 33 years, and think about that that's that's roughly 12,000 days Jesus lived on the earth 12,000 days and not one of them did he act selfishly and just do his own thing every day Jesus spent doing God's will I believe that Jesus and his father communed every day I think that's brought out in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 50 that the father and the son they, they the father opened the son's ear morning by morning 
but Jesus the Son had to live the life. And you, you think about that. When you think about your life, my life, how many days can we count where we can actually say, well, that day I did okay. That day I, I, didn't, I didn't lose my temper. I didn't envy others for what they had didn't break any of God's laws I mean we're lucky if we can count them on the, the, the fingers of, of, of two hands I would imagine we know we fail we know we fail it's the nature we have and we know how powerful our nature is how strong this is and, and it's given us that way God gave us this nature he made us the way we are and it's for a reason. It's because you're not born being, as it were, able to overcome these things automatically. You have to choose to do God's way. What's built into us is to do our own thing. That's from the very beginning. We see that with Adam and Eve, as, display, as displayed in, in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. We can see they represented us you know they, they, were, they were just the first of what was to come and we're all the same now imagine a man with our nature then for 33 years overcoming sin and that's the greatness of Jesus he just stands apart from everyone else you know, there's 7 billion people alive on the planet today and they, they, they estimate that there's 7 billion people lived in the past. So there's 14 billion people, 14 million million people who have lived on this earth since creation. And you thought, well, at least one of them would have done it. Not one. Romans chapter 3, that we're all guilty all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us have been able to do what God created us for, which was to, to, to be good, to, as it were, to, to re reflect him. None of us can do that. It's self. That's, and this is the greatness of Jesus and the greatness of the sacrifice that he made. And that sacrifice, he offered up his life. And God accepts that life. And the proof of that, he's... he's well, Romans chapter 1 tells us the, the proof of that, um, where he says, <clears throat> he's declared to be the Son of God, verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So here we have, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture that's, that's something which was promised from the very beginning in the promise that was given to, uh, to Adam and Eve through, through, uh, through God to, uh, to Adam and Eve and the, and the serpent there in the, in the garden of Eden and it's a promise which has come right the way through Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and our faith in these things is what counts to us with God for righteousness um, that's verse 20 of this uh, chapter 15 that we read together at the beginning having um, looked then at um, Christ died for our sins now but now, verse 20, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. So Jesus, God says through Paul here, Jesus is the first fruits. He's the first of those who are to come forth from the grave. Um, 
And that means there are going to be others. That's that, and that's the purpose of God. He wants to give everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoso believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That, that's, the, that's his purpose. That's his purpose in sending Jesus. He wants us to have everlasting life. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Fear not, little flock, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants us to have this everlasting life. But we have to choose. And it's quite clear, isn't it? It's not for everybody. I have colleagues at work, and uh, that, uh, when I used to work, um, people that I know, and they said, they don't, I, this life's all I want, and it's all they'll have. <laughs> you know? But it's not all we, all we need to have. You know, we, there is more. We can have life after death. We can, as it says in, this, in, this, uh, in these verses, um, very end of the well the, what we were reading if in this life verse 19 if in this life only we have hope in christ we are of all men most miserable if 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 it's only about living now well well that's it when we die that's the end of it but verse 20 but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep since by man came death man, by man came also the resurrection of the dead as in adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So life is to do with, everlasting life is to do with being in Christ. We'll be made alive. Verse 23, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. We've got to be in Christ and we've got to be, belong to him when he comes again. And that's, the message is, is quite clear, isn't it? That's, that's the way God has provided. Um, that's what we, what we have to do. I was just thinking of um, a verse in, in Galatians, speaking about the way in which we, um, we become in Christ. And, and Paul talking to the people in, in, in Galatia, he said to them... <clears throat> In the, uh, the end of chapter 3, it says, You are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So we've got to believe in what Jesus did, that he offered up his life to take away sin, to bring our forgiveness. As many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's only one way into Christ. You have to be baptized into Christ. There's no, the, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no bond or free. There's no male or female. Everyone is equal. We all need this way that God has provided. There's no other way. There's one way for us to, to be acceptable to God, and that's by accepting Jesus, repenting, believing, and being baptized. And if you be Abram's seed, uh, if you be Christ's, then you Abram's seed and heirs according to the promise. And, and that's just a reference again to, the, to this promise of life everlasting, which was given to Abram 2,000 years before Jesus. He was told he would inherit the land. Jesus said to his followers, the meek shall inherit the earth. God created the earth not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there's none else. If we want to be part of these things, there is a way. And it's by our accepting Jesus as that way God has provided for us to be acceptable to him and to be, therefore, the recipients of this, this everlasting life. Finally, then, we we'll just look at what Jesus says. Um, having made the sacrifice, risen from the dead, 
And now he's speaking to his disciples, and we're just going to look at Mark chapter 16, the very end of this chapter. And Jesus um, tells his disciples, you've got a message, you've, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God and the way in which we can be part of it. So um, verse 15 of this Jesus says to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. No one is exempt from, this is, the, this is God's way, it's the only way. No one's exempt. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be damned or condemned. Jesus rose from the dead. Will you? Well, it's in your hands. Whether or not you will accept this gracious way that God has provided for us. Well, whether you will respond to that that love of God, God so loved the world, God so loved you, God so loved me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Life or death, choose life.